vamos a comenzar esta mesa redonda eh, sobre infecciones respiratorias. Y quiero decirle que van a estar eh, conmigo expertos de distintos países. Y nosotros pensamos que este tema es altamente relevante porque, como ustedes saben, eh, recientemente se ha sabido que en el mundo aproximadamente más de 2 millones y medio de personas mueren por año por infecciones respiratorias. Y esto ocurre fundamentalmente en los dos extremos de la vida, ¿no? En, en, en niños menores de 5 años y mayores de 70 años. Bueno, la realidad de todo es que muchas de estas muertes son totalmente evitables por vacunas, por mejora de las condiciones de vida. Many times they are sent to uh, critical care units, and there are certain aspects that are uh, significant. First of all, how pneumonia can complicate an event as the uh, brain trauma. Many hospitalizations are due to these. There is also an important percentage of the importance of biomarkers. And finally, there is an important interest on how the future treatments should go because we are uh, getting read, we are lacking defensive weapons, so to say, due to the uh, resistance micro uh, bodies. First, we will start with the um, presentation on multi-resistant German, German by Dr. Pérez Pedrero from Spain. We will start with uh, Maria Jose then. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to move up my presentation because I need to take a, a flight this afternoon. I was suggested to talk about the, what's new in the treatment against in respiratory infections. What are the new cephalosporins in the market that can help in the treatment of the new Back, uh, multi resistant bacteria that I think it's a problem all over the world and the ICUs. As we know, the uh, problem of this uh, multi resistancy has been uh, spread all over the world, even though each center must know what the flora they are dealing with. And, but we always know that what is coming from other places always arrives uh, to our hospital. In Spain, we uh, we are facing a spreading issue. We had a problem, a relatively light pr issue in 2015, but in last years, these bacteria have been spreading all over, so that now uh, we are uh, in, the, in the red area of the map. That means our, the issue is uh, more severe. The WHO estimates that by 2015, these will be the deaths due to motor resistant bacteria. The issue seems to be far from being solved, and it's still very concerning. We do know that these bacteria, as the microbiologists say, they are uh, an epidemiologist problem, and they colonize patients a lot, and they infect less than less resistant bacteria, but the truth is that when they do, they kill, and they kill more frequently than the more sensitive uh, bacteria to antibiotics. The bacteria that uh, was estimated in 2014 among uh, ICU patients is around 30%. What is new against this? 
So far, we've been enduring a drought in the treatment of this infection. We have to use, we have had to use antibiotics that were uh, uh, discontinued because they were very toxic, but we had to recover them and because we had no new weapons against this infection. But in the last years, new investigation research has been um, leading to new products that are helping us to control to limit the issue. Here you can see a map of what we have now and what can be expected. We will be able to attack the uh, carbapenemasa and uh, uh, different types of them, and maybe also something for the Kelevitobacter. Here in pink you see what is already available as for BGM multiresistant the Theftolothanobactam and Theftolothanobactam and Avibactam. Now uh, we will be talking about this, but about gram-positive, we also have had very little, very few um, new treatments, but a new cephalosporin has been created. It's relatively new that help us in the treatment against infections by these uh, resistant bacteria. There is also the dalbabancina dalba that for us in the ICUs uh, is, uh, help us because uh, we can provide, we can administer uh, one week doses, which is really useful, especially in pa patients with very long-term diseases like endocarditis. And the tedisolid, it's a um, modified molecule of linozolid with less uh, secondary adverse effects and, and better tolerance. When we have to select an antibiotic, we need to stop thinking, and as we all know, we we need to see what's the pathogen we're going to be against and what is the um, host characteristics. But we also need to bear in mind the the, the um, focal point, if that can be drained or not, because in that case, in a pos if it can be drained, that's much better. We also need to take into account the PK, PKPD and the CTC variables, and we also need to think about the sensitivity and resistance of that bacteria depending on our more uh, uh, frequent germs in our centers. The Theftolozanobactan is a molecule that is a cephalosporin, which is a positive thing, a new generation, fifth generation cephalosporin. And Tazobactan, we know it's an inhibitor of betalobactasis. But the interesting thing of this new antibiotic is these are the molecules, cephalosporin, Theftolothana, which is a zelospirin, which we all know are very useful, and we are really happy with the, its function. And indeed, it has developed an activity against different resistance mechanisms of bacteria. In general, and we're not, we're not going to go into detail, we know the mechanisms of resistance are very varied and can be combined. Mainly, we have these sedimones that can create resistances of uh, different types together in enduring treatment. This antibiotic, this molecule, can act on these different mechanisms. The uh, overexpression of bombs of expulsions. It is also active against beta-lactamase uh, type MZ, but not against BLEE. -E. When using that molecule, it can be active against it. So far, there's no uh, cross resistances with uh, Theftolozan, and it is not active against carbapenemas. So if we know that, uh, if we know that, we know there will be a resistance against that. Dose, uh, a virtual dose, usual dose is one gram per z uh, 0 0.5 of the other molecule. With this treatment, well, uh, uh, according to two research studies, one with a uh, bland part and the other is the ur urinary tractors, in order to identify 
the weak points in Numeni, we see that it's been accepted and indicated. No, there is no uh, evidence that uh, um, can support that. But we know that antibiotics are designed for one indication, and we clinics need to use uh, them to treat infections very usefully, not just the focal point, but also the bacteria. This role, oh, sorry, this paper that was published in 2012 is an in vitro study of penetration of Thetalothano, Leptolozen, and the Tazobactam together. And even though mm, levels in plasm are lower, when we go uh, and, and when they uh, go into the uh, lung, they show similar levels. When these dose of 1 gram, 0 0.5 uh, grams, are really effective against pneumonia. The activity of these uh, tathobactam and theptolozen against multiresistant bacteria, if we compare them with other antibiotics, antisidomonic, we see that this new molecule is still very sensitive with great difference for all the sets, including pan-resistant bacteria. We do this same thing for the uh, sensitivity spectrum among other multi-resistant bacteria. We see that it is still very sensitive, except when they are multi-resistant or when they are uh, carbatena mass. Then the uh, charge or the power is lost, and then it's useless. In this multi-center research study, we see evidence against different uh, focal points with different infections. It's used in pneumony, lysocomial um, pneumony. It's been used. It's rather effective. And 75% uh, of patients are cured with a uh, 25% of failure, which we know they are acceptable figures. Cef another uh, cephalosporin is this other molecule. It's just the opposite case. In this case, ceftazidim with the new, uh, the new molecule. It recovers the activity of theftazidine for these esterobacteria that have lost their sensitivity because they are carbapenemas carriers. This uh, returns, this gives them again an activity against certain bacteria, especially the KPC, which are the most sensitive with over 90% of uh, studies in epidemiology and OXA48, even though it's less sensitive to that. There are more resistance in, in these OXA48 and also the uh, C classes and AMP C class. This means we have enlarged the spectrum in order to treat uh, other multi-resistant bacteria. It also is active against pseudomons resistant to carb carbipenem. In this case, it's 67% uh, of sensitivity, which is lower. But those without uh, the resistance mechanism very probably are going also to be resistant. So the treatment should be guided by antibiogram. It does not have any activity against metallobacter lactamase. And I don't know if you have experience in that, but we are seeing that much and more and more in our hospitals. But that, that's still pending uh, research. About the dose, accepted dose is 2, 0 0.5 gram every eight hours. And the most uh, about the most effective dose is every two hours. This is a particular case in our unit where, well, this was a patient that was hospitalized with a bacteria, hematology bacteria with an aplasia after chemotherapy. And this is the spectrum of the alterobacteria from the first positive culture, where you see the colicin and hethaticlin, tzizicline, and we added a carbopenemas 
that was a uh, type C. And look, this antibiogram was from the 18th. And then in the, uh, day 23rd, we also did a bioculture. The catheter was retired, was withdrawn. And we saw that after only a couple of days, the uh, bacteria was resistant. This patient was. Uh, we were able to control the case at the end with theftazilin, avibactam. So in the end, it was sensitive to that. Well, the use for that, because it's new in the market, we don't really have that many cases published. But these two looked interesting to me because the use of an antibiotic that seems to be just thought for a partic particular multi-resistant bacteria, w well, we, c I we could think that it could be used in other therapies. And we know uh, th it should be used in combined and controlled dose, but it seems that there are, there are published series using ceftazidine, abibactan in monotherapy, and when compared with other treatments, it has more or less the same mortality rate and more or less the same recovery um, outcome. So it could be thing that it could be acceptable uh, for monotherapy treatment against infection with good results and reduction of mortality as compared to a classic combined treatment of 39.5% as compared to point, uh, f for 45% that we know so far it has. In this other case, it's more or less uh, the same. This is a study on 31 patients with um, only uh, or, um, patients that are immunodepressed, suppressed, and um, they are treated both into the directed and combined treatment. And with other 23 patients, um, and mortality after 30 days is uh, 45%. And in the group with aceftacidine is 52.2%. Uh, uh, clinic overcome was higher after 14 days, and the P was a significant one. How do we position these two new molecules against multiresistant? Uh, in our usual uh, scheme, if we compare activity, antimicrobial activity between ceftazidine and ceftazidine avibactan against multi multidrug resistant bacteria, we see that the first, no, sorry, the second ceftazidine avibactan has an effect a little different. Maybe the uh, first ceftolozan tazobactan is might be uh, thought for uh, multi-resistant bacteria, whereas the second is more against carbotenemas um, carrier uh, bacteria. We see in this graph where we see pseudomon, we see that The ceftazidine avibactan is at two, whereas 88% of sensitivity for this, whereas the sedomon are sensible in 24% is ceftazolan tazobactan. Uh, of course, for those intrabacteria which uh, with uh, resistant mechanism different to cephalomas, they are not going to be sensible. And the same with the pseudomons. Excuses, but uh, the speaker speaks very fast. Now uh, we see the Z, uh, CMI cards. Well, which one do we favor now? We have two new molecules, two new antibiotics. Obviously, zeptolozen would be uh, ideal for pneumonia, aerogenosa pneumonia. And of course, that will be for directed treatment. And we could also thought 
could also be thought as a diversification, and ambivectin could be more against um, introbacteria and more particular with uh, KPCs. And 90% of them are sensitive to this molecule and also could be thought as an alternative in, s in the case of pseudomons. But in that case, we should check that the uh, biogram says it is sensitive so that we are allowed so to, say, to use the same strategy. But it is not active. Uh, Septoluzan is not active against carbapenemase, but abibactan, yes, it is, but no, the VIM that should be treated with a classical treatment, but with echocholistine or others could be a uh, fight against. And last, finally, last, cephalo cephaloprene. It is a very useful one but not ideal for motor resistance is the ceftaroline. This molecule is absolutely new. It's a cephalosporin of fifth generation and has these features, but it's a bactericide activity. What is the action mechanism? And well, it, it, it joins PBDs to gram-positive and gram-negative cells. And finally, we found a molecule that is uh, effective against other new gram-positive resistant to B lactamic. This is a bactericide action. So what do we have here? It's a uh, titriasome with the same expector. It's a cephalosporin of third generation that is ac active against all gram-negative um, bacteria. But we also have the peculiarity that we have activity against estafilococ, a resistant estafilococ, and also a very special feature, which is active against pneumococcal with CMI that's so low that the activity, uh, bacteri bactericide activity is really significant, uh, even higher than act, uh, actual or current cephalosporin against pneumococcal. In the um, tests for cetaroline, focus one, focus two, for pneumony, there's nothing really special. With all pivotal studies, we just get uh, indication results. And it shows how it is not inferior, and its indication can be accepted for pneumonia. But it is striking that, as always with pivotal studies, I don't see critical, critical patients anywhere, but really? We have the experience that our patients in these studies are not really featured. But it's striking that the cut point is very low. It is true that each bacteria has a cut point for each bac uh, antibiotic and vice versa. But it is very striking that is uh, under 0 0.015 against 1. Zephtaroline is 0 0.015 to 0 0.12, and Thetriozone is 0 0.015 to 2. This makes us think that it could be, it might be more active when uh, treating pneumococcal infection. It should be checked in a clinic trial. It could be a hypothesis. When we carry out a study, and this analysis published in 2016, it's a meta-analysis of published studies of ceftriolene compared with ceftriozone. That was done in Asia. This, this study was carried out because FOCUS 1 and FOCUS 2 can be uh, 
found a, a, a fail the, in the dose and the dose uh, per per day, but in because the uh, Asian experts wanted to see that their population was equally active, they found that they could be using two grams every 24 hours as compared uh, uh, to the dose of the other antibiotic. In that study, with the meta-analysis, it could be seen that both in Focus 1 and Focus 2, it could be concluded that the dose was very low, but in the other tests, when dose was correct, it, show, it, it resulted that Theftorolin has a uh, most uh, faster uh, effect on patients, and patients are uh, over, uh, they do overcome faster and much better than in other uh, pneumonia treatment. But if we saw what happened to pneumococcal communitary infection, pulmon uh, pneumonia infection, now the percentage was very significant. Well, I should be, I should be ending now. This is just sensitivity right now. The mm, percentage of sensitivity in different areas. This was published and approved. We can see how 100% of cefalosporin, how pneumococcus are sensitive to cefalosporin. But even though we don't have that in Spain, resistance is being registered some uh, in other places. Here you see the indication for cefalosporin, pneumonia, uh, pneumonia is coming from community, and when there is a suspicion that the patient can have a communitary pneumonia due to uh, cefalosporin that is resistant, in our unit we have used it as a recovery treatment when the patient's not really uh, doing good outcomes or uh, showing good results. But the results after using this molecule only after 24 hours, the uh, reaction is spectacular. We've introduced it in our protocol as a recovery treatment for critical patients. And indeed, we have been using it. We, we Now that the um, flu campaign is about to start, and we are using it in uh, severe uh, adult patients with uh, multi-organ failure. We are using it as the first indication with very good results. Thank you very much. Maybe before you go, you can answer some of the questions that uh, some of the people want to um, ask. We have um, for that uh, Dr. Martin uh, from Spain and Dr. Lara from Colombia. Maybe you have some questions for uh, Dr. Pedrero. With the group that we have here in HM Hospitals Research, we are about to publish a meta-analysis in the network with regard to a new strategic approach that allows us to compare everything because the knowledge we have so far with regard to the knowledge with regard to the knowledge in um, pneumonia they usually compare only up to three strains so we need to find others as i said dr monte is about to publish our new results and we believe that this fifth generation, um, they involve a lesser mortality rate. That's why I believe it's an option. But I don't know why do you say this is like a rescue therapy and not a first line therapy? Because time's of the essence, and we know that more and more now. One hour in an infection, um, an hour or maybe when. Uh, you change the shift in nurses, then it's difficult t because f every hour wha that we don't treat, then um, there is more uh, risk. So why don't you think that they should be a first choice, the one that you mentioned? We began to use it as a rescue measure. I don't know what problem we can find in each hospital, but it is really difficult to 
fight a treatment that has already been established, for instance, the one of uh, Theptarson in a community uh, pneumonia, and to justify it um, in the hospital because the new treatment is more expensive, that is difficult. And we began to use it, but um, with certain reticence because they were telling us that it was too expensive. And so we began to use it with the idea of uh, maybe giving a new rescue treatment. However, our first experience, we all know about a patient that has died because um, there is a, maybe an aggressive strain. So our first patient gave us many, many problems, a multi-organ failure. And so there are no really good studies that really tell you that this is really so, so I can maybe bring it to my hospital managers to allow it. There is nothing with regard to trials. So I went to my hospital and I said, I'm going to give him this treaty, treatment, sorry, and um, it worked. And now when I have a patient, um, when I have this and he has this problem, then I don't do it as a rescue treatment. I do it as the current one, but it was difficult at first. Thank you, doctor. Manuel, maybe you want to share your experience with us. We know that you have wide experience in this topic. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Hello, Elisa. As I said, good afternoon to you all. It is a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Luis. I'm going to do my presentation now. All right. Well, good afternoon and good morning to you all. I'm talking from uh, the city of uh, Quito. That's a picture of my city. Quito is considered a World Heritage Site. It is the biggest one in Latin America, and we are very proud to show our city. That's why I wanted to show you this one. In order to introduce the topic, we have more and more uh, brain trauma in the world. And here you can see a comparison between North America and uh, Latin America. We have around 1,300 persons per 100,000 inhabitants, approximately. This is related to the unfortunate fact that mortality rate for brain trauma is much higher. Uh, in those countries that have low income compared to those that are wealthier. So we are talking about a very common problem that unfortunately has not been well studied, uh, especially with regard to uh, mechanical ventilation. It has been isolated with regard to the ventilatory associated pneumonia in patients with brain trauma. This is a slide that is historical. It belongs to a traumatic coma data bank. It was launched many years ago, and it gave us um, very good guidelines. And uh, at the time, 41% of these brain uh, trauma patients had uh, ventilatory associated uh, pneumonia or other diseases. This was a review that was published a few years later by Dr. Pedrosi, and he was also mentioning what are the extracranial organic dysfunction. And pneumonia that means 40% uh, of the cases. The precise epidemiology of patients with uh, brain trauma is not there for us, and it has not been studied. It can be up to 60%, and that is a reality. A data that we already know is that is an early onset. Between 50 to 61% of ventilatory associated pneumonia are early onset. But then we have other. Uh, other patients with a stroke, for instance, and they also have ventilatory associated complications that are mostly medical complications. And um, 
those with brain trauma suffer more from pneumonia than those that have a stroke. I said at the beginning that the data at the beginning come from uh, secondary sources. Here we have data from the SORT um, study, which is patients with uh, HIV AIDS and other type of neurological issues. And we can see that um, respiratory failure is the most common and then is renal failure. Also with regard to the infectious source, for uh, brain trauma uh, patients, 38% of those, they suffer from uh, some sort of ventilatory associated pneumonia. Here you, we can see our own data from our region. This slice belongs to an abstract of um, a scholar from 2015. ICUs from uh, Bolivia, from and the uh, hospital of uh, Quito uh, participated here. And most specifically, I'm going to uh, share some data that we are about to launch with regard to the best uh, TRSP trial. We're talking about patients with that average age of uh, around 30, 35 years. You can see that is not as frequent as um, in other, the ASPA is only 7% and the septic shock is not as common. And then there are other things that they have uh, more commonly like coagulopathy or others. These are more real data and they're ours. And pneumonia is more frequent. Frequent, sorry. We had 119 percent with uh, nosocomial pneumonia, which is 37 percent of all of them. So we can see that this frequency is no higher, lower uh, for other ICU patients. But what is important here, and you can see on the lower part of the image, is that with uh, the uh, tomographic scale, the higher. It is the higher is the incident of a pneumonia. And also for those patients that they have a symmetry because of that issue. Here are all the complications um, with the statistic significance for a severe brain trauma, like septic shock, for instance. And uh, you can see that afterwards is this noscomia pneumonia, about 37%. And this is important because it's the first type of data that we have. Survival or um, the lack of side effects is very important, which is not something that happened with um, other issues because the death rate is a lot higher. For instance, with septic shock, uh, survival rate is only 22%. Next, I would like to talk about risk fa factor. Here, I'm showing you a slide that is a few years old. It's about patients with general trauma. And the first risk factor for nosocomial pneumonia could be seen in the image. And here also are some of the treatment the use of hypertonic solutions, for instance, and hypothermia could be effective. This is a very interesting slice. It's also very old and it has not been repeated, but we can see here that the most prevalent risk factor for the onset or representation of uh, ventilatory associated pneumonia is, as I said, onset, early onset, which is the early colonization of the germ. For instance, for the Staphylococcus aureus is very important, and the pneumococcus is one or the most important risk factor. In the next image, you can see here that between those patients that have ventilatory associated pneumonia and those that do not, then mortality rate has no sig uh, statistic significance, but it has to do with the number of days that the patient had to stay with a ventilator and the ICU. So that's why we call it ventilatory-associated pneumonia. 
here you have a very suggestive title. It says that ventilatory associated pneumonia for um, those patients with brain trauma, they do not increase mortality. And you can see on the other side a multivariate study with regard to uh, mortality on the lower part of the left image. The impact is on the length of hospitalization and ICU and dependency of a ventilator. Here you can see a slide with um, more modern or recent data from a hospital in Barcelona in Spain on the impact of non-neurological complications in severe traumatic brain injury outcome. They sustain that 78% have to do with respiratory um, infection. So you can see that pneumonia is also very high incident. On another study, we repeat that uh, cranial hypertension or renal failure are also important. So we ratified the knowledge that pneumonia has no result on the prognosis with regard to death rate. Maybe something new is what happens with these patients that have early onset pneumonia and everything that has to do with brain oxygenation, that is, those patients that had a brain oxygenation device. Well, we see that the risk factor for early onset pneumonia is hypothermia uh, and gastric aspiration. But with regard to the lower part, which is more important for us to see, the oxygen on the brain diminishes very acutely. So we need to take into account that for those early onset pneumonia or with worse results, we need to take that into account and it's something new. Here I'm giving some uh, interesting title, which is the increase on the risk of pneumonia among these ventilated patients is a risk factor for ventilatory associated pneumonia. And every day counts. This study had many patients, in fact, tw almost 25,000 patients. This is a data bank from um, the uh, United States. And uh, out of these 25,000 patients, it was almost 1,600 pneumonia. I want you to pay attention to the following data. For every additional date on the ventilator, it is uh, increasing 7% of the risk of pneumonia. That is, time is of the essence. Here we have a recent publication with regard to certain controversies in winning from mechanical uh, ventilation and uh, the extubation of the neurocritical patient. The gold standard and the checklist for uh, extubation was usually for them to follow commands, orders. So we think, and we've said so in this, or in this journal, that in order to be intubated, does the patient need to have a positive leakage test? Uh, yes, but after the N-esteroid. With regard to intubated patient, does it need to follow command before extubation? Not if the assessment parameter of the uh, airways is good. What do we mean by this um, leakage test? Well, we believe that the patient needs to have a high Glasgow rate. And for us, if we follow a good protocol, then we could avoid some cases of pneumonia. Also, before our last message, I'd like to say that there has been a recent uh, meta-analysis review of five study, and they agree that the pneumonia will also depend on where the patient is, has been hospitalized. And so the results of this uh, analysis, the statistics will change depending on the location of uh, the hospitalization of the patient. And so pneumonia could increase or decrease. So what is my end message? As you've seen, pneumonia 
as we all know with neurocritical patients, is the uh, is a non-neurological complication that it is very, very frequent, especially for brain trauma. It has a very high incident, that's how things are, especially those early onset pneumonia. And I believe, and I insist, this is very, very important to say it. There has been some organizations that want to uh, give uh, antibiotics to protect these, um, these patients so that they do not uh, develop early onset pneumonia. It is obviously, it is obvious, sorry, that the severe brain trauma patients and uh, some uh, treatments are risk factors in order to develop pneumonia. The same as with other patients that we say that the strategy for winning an early extubation it must be a patient, it must be the goal, sorry. And we need to take into account if the uh, patient follows command. Apparently, the mortality rate for uh, patients with pneumonia and uh, with severe brain trauma, it's not clear. But it has more to do, not with pneumonia, not with brain trauma, with the length of stay. We usually say that we are living in the midst of a certain crisis with regard to uh, great trials because sometimes they um, give results that are unexpected and the things that we uh, plan for not always have good results. And I believe that uh, evidence-based uh, medicine is in crisis. So. I would like to share with you this uh, sentence by Bob Dylan. It says that sometimes it's not enough with uh, knowing the things. Sometimes we need to know what they do not mean. As you know, he has been awarded a Nobel Prize of Literature. I would like to leave you with some of the main um, artwork of my city. And I would like to thank you for listening to me for the past few minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel, for your excellent presentation. So, uh, questions will be at the end of our session. Next, we'll have a speaker from Brazil, Mr. Sayun, and he's going to talk about what is the biomarker guided therapy for pneumonia. Thank you, and we give the floor to our Brazilian speaker, Jorge, who is available now. Sorry that I speak English, but uh, my Spanish is just good enough for uh, small talk and conversation with my friends. So uh, I'll follow in English. The idea in the next minutes is to discuss the use of biomarker guided therapy for pneumonia, and I'm going to focus on ICU patients and mostly on the use of propulsion because where most of the uh, current evidence is based right now. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, next. Hello? Mm -hmm. So I have no conflict of interest with the topic. Next slide. So the idea in the next minutes is to talk a little bit about how the biomarkers work, if they do, to evaluate the response treatment. What are the limitations of biomarkers? I'll be very focused on the results of uh, randomized clinical trials because uh, we have a lot of uh, recent evidence in this methodology that summarizes both of the first two topics. And in the end, uh, in a more provocative approach, I will discuss what currently what we can call optimal care of pneumonia in patients in the ICU and how it correlates with the use of biomarkers. Next, please. Hello. <clears throat> so as said earlier, the reason why we are discussing biomarkers in critical care is related to the fact that um, we uh, already know that uh, antibiotic exposure is associated with both high costs and uh, high risk of potential side effects, but also with emerging bacterial resistance as it was presented in the previous sessions. We also do know that our current markers of response that we use for outpatient, for instance, are not valid for the critical view because the improvement of clinical features of uh, white blood cell count and even of radiologic markers occur very late in the course of uh, pneumonia 
and uh, especially in ventilated patients with ERDS, they do occur after the first week of antibiotics, which in most patients, which means that they actually happen at the moment that we should have been stopping antibiotics for these patients. So they're not very easy to manage in the early phase to evaluate the response. And also, the important thing about biomarkers is that although there is a plethora of biomarkers and studies, we do know that we have several uh, studies, both observational and RCTs, evaluating easily available biomarkers at bad sites such as C-reactive protein and procalcitonin. And this data shows that they potentially can help to shorten the duration of antibiotic therapy if we base uh, the uh, uh, use of antibiotics on the curves of response to therapy on the decay of the several level of these biomarkers. Next, please. Oh, thank you. Since most uh, clinical trials are based on PCT, we could reduce the topic of the session to can PCT be used for the evaluation of response to treatment or as a surrogate to stop antibiotics early? Next, please. In the first years of uh, the year 2000, uh, several studies came out. Uh, namely, the three more important studies were uh, on uh, uh, respiratory tract infections um, on a very wide range of severity of patients. So the PRORASP study, for instance, uh, they were all from the same group in Switzerland, and the PRORASP study, for instance, was a study that evaluated the treatment guided by procalcitonin in community acquired pneumonia in acute exacerbation of uh, 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 COPD in patients with bronchitis, in patients with asthma and respiratory infections, ranging from outpatients to ICU patients. And they all showed, as you can see in the left side of the slide, that there was a substantial uh, statistically significant decrease in the use of antibiotics when a procalcitonin-based algorithm was applied. The same happened, this is uh, the figure in the center of the slide, when a uh, uh, procalcitonin algorithm was used to guide treatment of community acquired pneumonia of inpatients, meaning hospitalized patients, both in the wards and in the ICU. Uh, although the mortality rates were similar, which is good because it shows safety of a shorter uh, course of antibiotics, uh, you could see that there is a substantial difference, almost halving the time or the duration of use of antibiotics in this patient. And in the last part of the slide, the right side, when we look at the PROVAP study, which evaluated patients with ventilator-associated pneumonia, there was also a substantial and significantly uh, uh, reduction in the use of antibiotics in these patients. Next, please. Next, you can pass, uh, please, because, yes. Next. You can move to the next slide, sorry. <clears throat> After these studies, a uh, study from uh, the, a group from France worked on a multi-center study, including eight intensive care units, and randomized patients, to, uh, uh, more than 600 patients, to a control group, which was based on local guidelines uh, uh, guiding the duration of antibiotic therapy, but at the discretion of the attending physician, and compared it to, again, a PCT-based guideline. The PCT was used as a marker to start and to stop antibiotics according to a very specific and tricky algorithm. <clears throat> in fact, documented infection was uh, perceived in uh, around 70% of the patients. The others were clinical suspicion. Next slide, please. It's important to say that this study, although it was at the time the largest uh, multicenter study, it uh, worked with all ICU patients and all ICU acquired infections and not only pneumonia. But there was something that was very striking about this study, was that the fact that uh, almost two thirds of the patients, uh, there was overruling of the protocols. That means that uh, <clears throat> for some reason, physicians did not feel comfortable about following strictly the protocol in almost two thirds of the patients. In sometimes it meant prolonging antibiotics despite the fall of uh, the, the levels of PCT, in some others uh, because of clinical instability, in other ones because they considered it inappropriate because of uh, the presence of uh, gram-negative infections due to Pseudomonas aeruginosa, for instance. But 
still, despite the overruling of the protocol and all these results, what happened was that the study could show that the PCT-based algorithm could shorten the duration of antibiotic therapy to 10 days as compared to 13 days in the control group. Next, please. This could be interesting. Next. But one thing is uh, that the study was actually powered to um, evaluate the duration of antibiotic and, or the antibiotic exposure. Next, please. However, what we can see is that although non-significant, there was a trend towards increased mortality and there was actually um, an increased and statistically significant uh, uh, percentage of late organ failure in the patients in the PCT algorithm. So, next please. This type of information uh, highlighted in the editorial that accompanied this uh, paper published in The Lancet a couple of years ago, highlighted that perhaps the strategy was not as safe as it was er uh, perceived in the earlier studies. Next, please. Next. Can you pass the next slide, please, Paul? Sorry. Next. And the next. So, <clears throat> after almost 10 years of this controversy, several evidence accumulated, and I'm trying to summarize this in the next three slides. So there was this recent meta-analysis published just last year in the Lancet Infectious Disease uh, that was looking at all sorts of um, uh, respiratory infection and the studies that evaluated uh, RCTs um, comparing PCT-guided versus uh, control groups, meaning uh, at the discretion of physicians to treat the different sorts of infection. It again, it compiled information from outpatients and to uh, um, to uh, ICU patients with VAP, meaning that a wide range of severity and very heterogeneous. But the study or the meta-analysis actually summarized this information in a way that it showed actually that there was again reduction and significant reduction in the exposure to antibiotics when patients were guided by uh, procalcitonin protocol as compared to control groups. Next, please. When we look at just ICU patients, it's very interesting to see that both for uh, general ICU patients, meaning those with CAP or nosocomial pneumonia or VAP, there was a substantial reduction again in the duration of antibiotic therapy. And that was also true for the patients with VEP. Um, next, please. However, when we look at the total duration of antibiotic therapy, what we can see is that the average PCT-guided therapy in the ICU actually used nine days of antimicrobials. When we look at just VEP patients, it was 11 days. And it's very uh, compelling to me to think that although this information shows that there was reduction in the exposure to antibiotics. What we can clearly see here is that the average use of antibiotics in the PCT-guided patients was uh, much more than the guidelines would recommend for the standard situation when these patients are treated. Next, please. <clears throat> so this year, um, another study evaluated uh, an RCT, the largest RCT so far, uh, more than uh, uh, 1,600, uh, 1600 patients uh, in the U.S. were uh, randomized to receive usual care versus PCT-guided care. This was for lower respiratory tract infection. There were patients with severe cap that were hospitalized, and there were patients that were treated with antibiotics as outpatients. However, when we look at just uh, hospitalized patients, the average use of uh, antibiotics was similar between patients uh, treated with the PCT-guided uh, therapy or patients treated at the discretion of the attending physician with no increase in mortality. Next, please. This is just to show a uh, very nice slide of the distribution of total, total antibiotic days, showing that actually uh, <clears throat> from day zero to day 30, when, when was the follow-up, the curves are virtually the same, showing that there was actually the same exposure to antibiotics in both groups. Next, please. So the conclusion of the study is that a PCT-guided therapy in the emergency department, either for outpatients or inpatients, did not result in less use of antibiotics uh, 
as compared to uh, the usual strategy in patients with suspected low respiratory tract infections. Next, please. However, among the controversy, I think that if we are to use PCT, we should keep in mind that um, there is some physiology that w should also guide us. So the first thing is that um, the levels of PCT are reduced when a patient receives renal replacement therapy. So this could lead to a false perception of decreased severity or, or response to treatment, and we should keep it in mind. Uh, on the contrary, they do increase when patients have lower glomerular, glomerular filtration rates, meaning that, for instance, either patients with chronic or acute kidney uh, injury will have uh, naturally higher levels of PCT when they present with an infection, and the decay of this PCT may be slower than the usual. Again, something which is very interesting because a lot of the studies treat first nosocomial infections uh, guiding by PCT, but we know that patients that stay in the ICU frequently have uh, more than one uh, nosocomial infection. This multiple insults may result in a phenomenon of physiologic fatigue in the increase of PCT, meaning that it will increase in the first ins insult, it will increase perhaps in the second infection, but then it will have a blunted response in the subsequent infections. So it could not be very safe to use in this scenario. And to finalize this, there's also a high rate of false negatives. And when we look at most of the studies, and even those included in the meta-analysis, almost 20% of the patients or up to 20% of the patients could have a false negative PCT, meaning that starting or stopping by PCT alone without considering other clinical uh, um, evaluation is uh, at least uh, risky. Next slide, please. Another thing just to mention is uh, CRP, because uh, there's a lot of concern regarding the use of regular use of PCT because of cost. And C-reactive protein, on the other hand, is um, very uh, uh, inexpensive and easily available, and uh, most physicians have uh, uh, familiarity with its use. So in this randomized clinical trial, it's a single center study, they compared strategies by guiding by PCT alone or PCT-CRP. They uh, showed that uh, using uh, an algorithm based on CRP is safe, and uh, they used actually a very interesting protocol, next please, uh, where they used the kind of double trigger. So the first thing was that if there were no signs of infection, because lots of times we start antibiotics for patients because of suspected infection and then there's pulmonary edema, we will take out of catheter and fever will go away, they did stop uh, antibiotics regardless of the biomarker. The next thing, uh, next slide please, is that uh, they used also uh, <clears throat> the, the, the decay in both PCT and CRP as uh, uh, um, uh, guidance, but also they took into consideration um, a maximum number of days of antibiotics. So that in this study, actually, next please, they could demonstrate both that this strategy was safe, next please, and also that the use of antibiotics was very reduced to less than a week in both cases, six days in CRP and seven days in the PCTR. Next please. An important question that we should raise is how we do without biomarkers. So we have evidence like this study from almost 15 years ago from the group from the US showing that if you use a protocol based discontinuation, meaning that when you reach a certain number of days and plus clinical resolution, you can actually safely stop antibiotics for patients within seven days of treatment when you're treating VAP. Next, please. Next. Again, this study also 15 years uh, old already showed that when you compare and randomize patients to eight or 15 days of treatment with antibiotics for VAP, the outcomes are virtually the same. So we can pose ourselves the question, do we need actually biomarkers to treat our patients when uh, adhering to protocols seems to have the same effect in terms of duration of antibiotics? Next, please. Next. And actually, when we look at this slide that compares intervention days and control groups, what we can see is that clearly control groups are not adherent to guidelines 
in the studies, the three uh, studies below, which are the studies uh, guiding by PCT. So maybe we could perceive that there was reduction just because PCT brought us closer to adherence to guideline as compared to control. Next, please. Next. So the question actually is, is usual care in the control group actually the best care, actually the best practice and what we should be doing regardless of, of, of the uh, biomarkers to guide our antibiotic therapy? Next, please. Next again. Next. So do we actually need biomarkers to guide antimicrobial therapy for pneumonia patients in the ICU? Probably no. Next, please. However, if we pose the question in a different way, should we use the biomarkers to guide the therapy? Well, maybe. Maybe there are special cases, patients with burns, patients uh, with immune suppression, where it's very hard to figure out the response to therapy. And also, we should consider that, at best, what the literature shows us is that biomarkers increase the ability of physicians to adhere to the recommendations of the guidelines. Next, please. In conclusion, I think that the concept, the physiological concept behind uh, the use of biomarkers to guide antimicrobial therapy is very uh, uh, robust. Uh, I, it's very clear also that uh, there are several clinical trials showing that PCT can reduce the uh, exposure to antimicrobials because it uh, will aid in the uh, assessment of response to treatment in critically ill patients. However, it's very hard to prove that actually PCT-based guidance is better than what would be best care. And actually the response to it would be uh, multi-center trials with at least triple arm or at least a control group that is adherent to evidence-based uh, recommendation in terms of duration of antimicrobial therapy. Thank you very much. We have a question for uh, Dr. Salo in Brazil. Lo sentimos, pero no se oye la pregunta, por lo cual no podemos interpretarla. Es una pregunta muy interesante, de It's hecho. Very important uh, in the scenario of multi resistance. So the first point is that um, uh, we have a paper that just came out this month, uh, looking into patients with VEP and ventilator associated tracheal bronchitis, and we could not find differences in baseline level at the day of the diagnosis when you compare multi resistant and non multi resistant pathogens. This does not mean we should not use PCT or, or CRP for this patient. This just means that at the day of the diagnosis, it's not good enough to discriminate the pattern of resistance and we still have to wait for the other mi traditional microbiology approach. Uh, but going directly to your question, which is um, in terms of using this bio biomarker as a measure of response to therapy, the evidence that we have from observational studies is actually that um, <clears throat> first, uh, when you start an empiric antibiotic and you do not observe um, quick uh, drop in CRP or PCT levels in the first 72 hours, you should have a high suspicion either of multi-resistance or of some local complications such as empyema or a bacteremia because uh, this would be a signal of failure or delayed response to therapy. So yes, if it does not decrease fast, meaning more than 50% in 72 hours, you should think of motor resistance. The second thing is from observational studies, and we also have uh, our own data on this and, and studies on community acquired pneumonia, is that the response to, can be accurately followed either by CRP or PCT, even when the bacteria is multi resistant. So, this means that if when we start antimicrobials, if we get it right, even if it's a multi resistant pathogen, the pattern of fall in these biomarkers may be a little bit slower, but we can still trust it as a marker uh, of response to therapy in the first three to five days. Muchas gracias, Jorge. Is there any other question for our speakers? We have a question from Dr. Martin. Yes, I wanted to ask Dr. Hibaja 
that if they usually have a selective um, a selective um, contamination for your patients and what has been your experience? No, we don't. We don't use it. But I think your question is very important because it seems that uh, for those type of patients, we should use it. Sh we should use it, shouldn't we? Dr. Martin, in your experience, I know that in your center you do use it. So what's your opinion with regard to this with the neurotrauma patients? I know that in Ibiza, the neurological uh, damage patients are very common. Yes, in our unit, we have a lot of neurocritical patients. And for the past few years, we've had this um, oral uh, contamination, selective contamination, and we've had lower VAP levels. That together with the rest of the pre um, prevention pneumonia kit that we call it. I have a question for you, Dr. Martin. Since you talked about the selective contamination, could it increase the rate of um, of uh, the multi-resistance, has it had an impact on the flora? No, we haven't noticed an increase of resistance and we had really high numbers of VAP and it has been sensibly decreased. Great, that is awesome results then. Well, thank you very much for your response. I think that we can close and our fourth session. Thank you for inviting us for listening us and for the wide visibility of this event. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you to our panelists and to all the speakers. See you in 2019. Thank you all. Thank you, Elisa.